How's it going, guys? Um, yeah, so uh, we're here from Rodef Shalom School. It's a private Jewish day school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And uh, yeah, just want to quickly introduce myself. Um, name's Adam Newman. Basically, we're, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, <laughs> so to speak. But uh, basically, uh, yeah, we've been administering Max now for over 10 years. Um, go back a long way with it from uh, monolithic imaging to then modular, and then we finally got our jump uh, jump start in 2012. Back when it was, uh, we knew it as Casper then, but I guess I don't know. Was it the mattress company? Is that why we call it? We don't use Cat <laughs> Casper anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm ignorant about this. Anyway, um, that's basically uh, all I have to say for now. I'm going to hand it over to Steve. Okay. I'll be back. Okay, so my name is Stephen Bradley. I'm the technology specialist at Rodef Shalom School. We are an independent Jewish day school uh, based on the Upper West Side of New York City. And by now, you're probably trying to place my accent. And it's north of England, near Manchester. I'm not a Manchester United fan, though. <laughs> okay. So we're just going to quickly go over the agenda of what we're going to go through over the next half an hour or so. So we are going to be talking about the one-to-one -one system that we set up this summer. And the way in that we did this was through the Apple device enrollment, formerly DEP. And our exact method and the exact method that we followed through in order to achieve this within Rodef Shalom School. And then, to conclude the presentation, we want to talk about where we see ourselves going from here, and really the no step three as went over in the uh, keynote. So right there, you are looking at our life during the summer. This was one of two rooms. We had the pre-stage room, and we had a file vault room, which Adam will talk a little bit more about later. But as you can see there, we have multiple laptops that were all plugged in through Ethernet and downloading the correct pre-stage. So the decision was made to go from shared laptops to that every single student would have their own individual laptop, which of course meant that we had to set all of them up from grades 5th through 8th. So the benefits of this are of course no more shared laptops. If you have shared laptops in your school, I can guarantee that you have students who leave the laptops behind toilets or leave them in God only knows where all over because the personal responsibility over those devices is minimal because they can go to the carts, they can take them out of the carts, and then who knows from there. So already we're noticing that by giving people the personal responsibility over these laptops, laptops are named for them, they are the one that fully control that laptop, there's a higher level of responsibility and they tend to look after them better. It's also an easier life for us. I remember years ago, we would be imaging at the time, back in England, you had all these different departments who needed different software, different requirements, and then it would be a matter of working through a list, or oh, the history department requires X, Y, and Z, science requires X, Y, and Z. This is a great system because now what we're doing is that we're giving everyone a uniform laptop and then making the applications available within self-service so that then they are able to download themselves and have control over their own laptops. So as you can see here, there's a huge um, pile of laptop boxes with all of our faculty's names on. So the laptops are set up, they're ready to go. So then on the first day of school or in teacher week, the teachers can come into the office, simply find their name, take their box, and then begin doing the things that they need to do. Okay, so now, as I mentioned earlier, the way that we achieved this initially was through the Apple device enrollment, formerly DEP. I'm going to hand back to Adam now to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Okay, so regarding <coughs> Apple's device enrollment, formerly DEP, um, we first wanted to make sure that we set our organization up with one of Apple's device enrollment programs. I know now that they use Apple School Manager and Apple Device Manager. We still have ours set up on the original DEP system, but we'll be migrating that very soon. Um, 
we do believe that device enrollment is very key to the success for a one-to-one -one program. Um, it's just a very big part of the puzzle. And uh, very important is to make sure that your devices are all purchased directly from Apple. If you don't do this, you might not be able to enroll your devices into DEP at all. Um, we have a, an Apple rep that we always just put our orders in with, so that pretty much keeps everything in line. And of course, part of that process is integrating the Jam Pro server with Apple's device enrollment. And this allows the devices to interface with our server as well as Apple's uh, enrollment services. So just a couple of, uh, on a more broad aspect of this, we established a DEP instance on our Jam Pro server. And assuming all went as planned, all the devices that we would see on Apple's DEP portal, we would also then see within, on our server itself, I'll actually go ahead and show you the handwriting, you know, sorry for the, the microscopic imagery here, but you'll just have to believe me that that red arrow points to uh, the account that we created for Apple's DEP program. We called it DEP at rssnyc.org. Uh, very creative. Um, and our, up there for the display name, this is our device enrollment program instance. We call it RSSMDM. There's no right or wrong way to do it. That's just how we did it. Um, so I, as I said, you can, you can view all the devices that are in DEP that your organization has. And uh, just to mention, you can, what's circled up there is computers. You can actually filter out, you can see all devices, that would be computers and iOS devices. But in our case, our one-to-one -one program is computer-based, so I could just filter by computer. And what's circled there below is basically, you could see for, it basically says pre-stage enrollments. And in this particular case, we create a few pre-stage enrollments, and I'll go into that after this, but it'll show the name of the enrollment for that machine, along with the date that it was assigned to that pre-stage enrollment, and then on the far right, the date that it was uh, added to Apple's DEP service to begin with. And I think that pretty much goes with when we actually made the big order. So what we did was uh, we created multiple pre-stage enrollments, faculty and students. We then created smart groups for each pre-stage enrollment. And we then scoped policies and configuration profiles to each of these smart groups. It allowed for good management. Specifically, being that we are K-12, we felt that it made sense to divide faculty and students. It's pretty easy to do, um, makes sense. But depending on what kind of organization you're at, you can do this any way you want. You could have more pre-stage enrollments. You could have one for marketing, one for finance, one for engineering. You know, it could serve their needs more specifically. And you'll just have to believe me, but on the far left where it's cropped out, um, there is an option to click on pre-stage enrollments. It's computers, management, and then pre-stage enrollments. And right here, it'll just show we have two we created. One was called DEP faculty, the other was DEP students. And just as an illustration, um, this would be our students pre-stage. Um, we made sure that we didn't want to check to automatically add devices to pre-stage enrollments because we have multiple ones. If we only used one pre-stage enrollment, that would mean that every device that was in DEP, we would want it to be enrolled automatically in this pre-stage, so then we would check that. But we have multiple enrollments, so we didn't, we didn't want to go that way. Um, we also made our MDM profile mandatory. Um, and then there's lots of other things, like when the machine first gets set up, you can have certain prompts come up, or you can check them. And that actually hides the prompts. And we'll be going into that process a little later and just how we handled it. So just going a little more into it, um, 
just in the account settings itself, we set up our management account through here. Very similar, like a lot of the things that we used to do in imaging, we're trying to replicate the process with DEP. Um, we then still rely on a local admin account for occasional IT tasks, so we put that account in there as well. And uh, then the actual standard one-to-one -one user account, this is the account that gets created when the machine is set up, goes through Setup Assistant, um, we decide for standard accounts. We don't want to be giving students and faculty local admin rights, we're just not, we're not ready to do that yet. Um, but we continue to think about it. Um, the, uh, at Rich Troughton's uh, presentation yesterday, I did, I was intrigued by the Privileges app that they created. And uh, I think that's something we're going to play around with. So basically, you know, you can make your passcodes as complex as you want. You could set that here. Um, something I wanted to go into a little bit, it's just something that we ran into. Um, we had actually piloted um, a small amount of one-to-one uh, -one laptops for faculty summer of 2017. And uh, after the fact, we then um, added a uh, third-party SSL certificate. And uh, after doing that, we noticed that we were no longer able to enroll faculty computers. What it came down to was uh, the certificates uh, settings we still had left over in there, the uh, Jam Pro Server built-in certificate authority. It was still listed there, and apparently uh, that caused a lot of problems. So we, we were told that we actually should just delete that. Once we deleted it, everything worked as, f as it should. There's actually a feature request on Jamf Nation. Don't automatically add Jam Pro Server built-in CA to anchor certificates in DEP pre-stage enrollments when using a third-party SSL cert. That's just take my word for it, it's up there on Jeff. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we ran into that and I'm sure others have too. Um, so that was just one gotcha. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, we create smart groups for each of these enrollments and uh, it's pretty easy. Um, there's already a criteria built in, enrollment method, pre-stage enrollment. And then for the operator, we had an equal either DEP students, that was for one smart group, and then DEP faculty, that was for the other smart group. We then scope policies and configuration profiles to each of these smart groups. It's simplified management, but uh, there was a new wrinkle. Um, as part of our device setup process, as I was saying before, we no longer can do the imaging configurations. It's just imaging is dead, of course. Well, it's, it's in its death throes, I guess. But uh, so we created a policy in self-service that pretty much installs all the same programs and uh, a lot of the same scripts and settings that previously were in our imaging configurations. It's part of the setup process. We have a little in-house guide that Steven's going to talk about after I'm finished. Uh, you know, and here's just a typical illustration of the configuration profiles. Uh, this would be for a student machine. And you know, we have certain configuration profiles that are more broad, that might be for everything. And then we have some that would be just for the student machines. Like we have a specific, uh, uh, we have a specific uh, wireless LAN that the students connect to. So we set that up for student laptops Wi-Fi. We have certain other settings that are just for student laptops only. But then there's other ones that, you know, the uh, approved kernel extensions, that was uh, for 1013. And uh, we had to create a whitelist for that. Now this year, we're testing uh, privacy controls for Mojave, currently blocking Mojave, because education environment, we're already trying to deal with software that is, uh, the, the teachers still want to use it, and its compatibility is sometimes a little iffy, but it's a, it's a culture thing, I guess. But uh, the goal will be in the future that the second the new OS comes out, we'll be ready for it. We're, we're getting better at that. Um, so we also uh, scope policies to the uh, smart groups. And typical, these are basically the typical policies for a student computer. I mean, we have everything from adding printers to uh, you know, certain programs that the students can install. And uh, you know, it might differ from what's the policies that go to a faculty machine. 
uh, just some general, you know, advice just from the experience we've had in our environment. Again, like there's, this isn't the only way to do this. This is just how we came to do it. Um, we felt it was important to make sure that once we went one to one for real, that we had external access to our uh, JSS. And so we created a, uh, using Ubuntu, uh, thanks to uh, the CJA course uh, that I was in last summer with Amit, uh, learned some cool stuff there and then installed an Ubuntu server and a DMZ. And then we had communication to the outside. And then uh, using an excellent uh, blog by Rich Troughton, we set up our uh, a cloud distribution point in Amazon Web Services, and it's been working flawlessly. Uh, we also set up third-party SSL cert. Ours was through DigiCert. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you set this up after you've already created a pre-stage enrollment, you might want to just double check on the anchor certificates. Um, if you see the leftover uh, built-in one, just, it's best to just delete it. And you know, then just for general, you know, if you're just trying to look for answers and stuff, of course, there's Jamf Nation. Some great communities, you know, Mac admin Slack channel. I've been all over that lately, mostly lurking. But uh, so many smart people just submitting, like, just, just great, great, uh, great stuff going on up there. Just the conversations and the issues that you have, someone's already likely had to deal with it. So, and of course, you know, some blogs like uh, Der Flounder, Mac Mule. Um, you know, I could go on and on, but it's, it's important to, to be aware of these sources of info. And uh, you know, don't be afraid to contact Jam Support if you just can't figure it out. Um, you know, don't let your pride get in the way. <laughs> uh, and you know, something that we uh, Steve is going to go into is we, for our IT staff, and also let's say we had an intern come in and just need to set things up for us. We wanted to because we don't have everything fully automated yet. It's not no touch. Um, we did want to create an in-house guide for how we were going to set the laptops up. And uh, so that's one thing we also did. And I might have mentioned it before, we did pilot about 20 the previous summer just to work out some of the kinks. And uh, well, it actually worked so well that after the first 20, they immediately wanted us to do another 15. <laughs> you know, we weren't planning on that, but that meant it was going pretty well. And also take advantage of VPP. If there are apps that are available in VPP, um, and they're also available in a non-VPP form. Um, it's, just, it's so much easier now to deploy apps with VPP. So we're trying to go in that direction. We're trying to push for it. And then, you know, just always be testing. Always be testing. And uh, after you're done testing, uh, you know, you might need to do more testing. Just because, you know, it's just how it goes. Anyway, going with the setup guide, um, we sliced and diced the guide up for you guys so we could put it into slide form. And uh, Steve is going to go into that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so I think something that Adam touched upon that's very uh, important is that the great thing about Jam is that there's always 20 ways of doing something but this was the way that we achieved our objectives. So once everything that has been set up in the JSS is ready to go, we then need to know how to get these laptops set up with this process. So this is the exact guide that we gave to the IT staff. Whether or not you are doing this yourself or you're having other people do it, I would highly advise that you create a kind of checklist so you can be uh, assured of the fact that you're getting everything done correctly and in the right order. So this guide, I think Jam are going to make it available online as well as the keynote after this. So if you miss anything, don't worry about it too much. OK. So a lot of this will seem initially basic, but it's amazing how just forgetting one step, like forgetting to plug a laptop in or forgetting the power strip and turning it on can result in disaster or at least you know, highly delayed work. So the first thing that we wanted them to do is to ensure that it was plugged, all the laptops were plugged into a power source. They were all connected via Ethernet because we had 30 laptops in the room at the same time, so we wanted to ensure a stable connection throughout the process. And then you can see so that we were setting these laptops up through internet recovery. 
and you guys may know this or may not, but there is different shortcut keys for internet recovery that do different things. The one, the option that we went for is that these laptops were going to boot up with the um, option to upgrade to the latest OS available. And then step two, choose English, providing that you speak English. If not, don't choose English. Huh. Okay, so this is going to be a familiar screen to I think probably everybody in this room. So we wanted to start all these laptops with a fresh, up-to-date build of um, High Sierra in this case. So we went into Disk Utility and we formatted the drives and then obviously renamed them Macintosh HD, ready to install High Sierra, High Sierra rather. And you can see there we were going through the process of installing. Don't forget to read absolutely every single word of that agreement before clicking Next. <laughs> Okay, and then, of course, installing High Sierra again. Going through the initial setup things, choosing the country and the keyboard and all that good stuff. Okay, so here's where it gets interesting. So you can see, because these laptops were registered in DEP, and also because we'd assigned them to either the student pre-stage or the faculty pre-stage, you can see there that it's saying that Rod F. Shalom School I want to get the exact wording, uh, it can automatically configure your computer. In other words, it's been recognized that there's a, a profile waiting for this. And then you can see it's contacting the enrollment server and then configuring the Mac. And that depends if it's in DEP student, it will then pull down the student profile. And then if it's in faculty, it will get the faculty profile, as Adam went over before. So. Through Adam's settings, you saw before that an admin account had already been installed on the laptop when it was doing the configuration shown previously. So then we went and added a local user account to all of these laptops. Now we moved from every single teacher in the school previous to this had an iMac with a login. So we essentially just recreated their username and password to what they'd been using the previous year to try and make it a little bit more uh, easy for them when they started school again. So you can see there, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's Adam there when he did his. So once the user account has been created, it goes into the familiar looking High Sierra background. And then we had our text go into self-service. Now in self-service, you can see highlighted right there, there's something called faculty laptops pre-stage configuration. And the student laptops, as you can probably guess, was student laptop um, pre-stage configuration. Now, by hitting install there, you have uh, programs such as Microsoft Office, maybe uh, printers that are being used in those areas, and different settings and everything else. Essentially, it's a huge goodie bag of, of all different things that the users need as a base in order to do the work correctly. Once this is installed, the computer then automatically restarts. You can see there, so this is when it runs through the, um, the installation of all the different settings and applications and everything else. You see, it usually takes about 15, 20 minutes, right, Adam? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the final thing that we wanted to do, so we had this nice, fresh install of the most up-to-date operating system possible at the time. So the only thing left to do in this stage was to install the updates. And I think at the time, it was there was an iTunes update and there was a Safari update that needed to be put on. So we had them do that also. OK, so the next thing is very much Adam's baby, Adam's project. So I'm going to invite Adam back to talk about um, encrypting the hard drives. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so this was just you know, regarding security and whatnot, being that this is an EDU environment, um, and these are laptops. Um, well, we also had a, an EFI firmware password that we configured on all devices. But on top of that, we wanted to encrypt the hard drives. If, if someone lost their laptop or it got stolen, uh, at least it wouldn't be of any use, and no one would be able to get the information off it. So um, we set up a policy, basically, to encrypt the drives. As part of our guide, you know, the tech would click on Encrypt Max within self-service. And uh, you know, then it would just go through the process. 
it would ask you if you want to encrypt. Of course, you click encrypt. And uh, it should show a little banner in the upper right indicating that you should log out at the next opportunity. If you log out at the next opportunity, it will then prompt you to enter your password. You put the password in. And that will commence the file vault encryption process. What we found is that compared to Sierra, High Sierra, the encryption process took ungodly long. So as Stephen alluded to before, we had a separate room. Like the classrooms were all empty during the summer. So while one classroom was used for the initial setup of everything, we would then take these laptops, plug them into power, and uh, we'd set them up in their own room separately. And the drives would just be encrypting overnight. And we'd come in in the morning, and that encrypting process, the, uh, the progress bar, would be, would be done. And one other thing that we found with High Sierra was that uh, secure tokens were required in order to enable accounts for File Vault. And the only account that we found that was working with High Sierra initially was the account that we created upon setup. Our built in admin account was not available when we'd first turned the machine on. And uh, being that we still rely occasionally on the built in admin account for IT tasks and stuff, um, need to figure out a way to to fix that. So basically there, was a, there were a few scripts that we worked with uh, on GitHub and uh, the end result of the script was to add a secure token to our local admin account. And uh, basically the way the policy works is that a little pop-up will appear on the desktop. Uh, it says encryption update required on your RSS computer and really scary words below, per information security requirements, we need to update the encryption settings on your Mac. Please click the next button below. Then enter your password when prompted. Um, even if they try to ignore this, the box will not go away. They can't, they can't exit out. It will be in their face, so they'll have no choice. This is assuming that we don't already see this pop up the next day when we come in, because this is triggered. Once the drive encryption completes, then this policy gets triggered. So. Um, once that's done, you can also confirm how this works if, if uh, under the hood, for instance, if you go in the terminal um, and you, uh, you go FD setup status, um, it will show that file vault is on. If you uh, type in FD setup list, it will then list the file vault enabled accounts. And as you can see there in the terminal window, um, there's the A Newman account, that's me, and then the local admin account. But if we did that same FD setup list before this policy ran, it would just show the A. Newman account. And uh, I'm going to give it back to Steve now. Thank you. Sorry. So the, the final check for the, um, the text was just to go through a few things. So as I explained earlier, all these laptops were set up with a, an Ethernet connection. So something that could go wrong is that the Wi-Fi profile didn't um, come down properly don't notice because it's still got the Ethernet connection, so they've not noticed that the internet's not working correctly. So we basically just had them check that the Wi-Fi was set up correctly. And then you can also see that we wanted the dock to look like it's looking there in the picture. Something interesting, you might notice our school logo is on the dock. That is, That was the case after we branded self-service, changed the icon from the self-service icon to the uh, Rod of Shalom logo. So this is perhaps the most technical part of this entire presentation, is creating a label and sticking it on the back of the laptop. The reason that we did this was, so you imagine you have a room full of 30 laptops that are all going through File Vault, and then they've, they've finished them and you've closed the lid and everything, and then it starts to become a problem of exactly which has got which username and turning them back on and everything like this. And obviously around the school we want the students not to swap laptops all the time. So simply just putting a label on the back and then writing the student or the faculty member's name on the side of the laptop, putting it back in the box was incredibly helpful. So the future, ideally, and I think probably everybody's the same, we want to get to a point whereby we can do this with far less input from our IT techs. We want to put more emphasis on the users doing these steps themselves putting in their own name, putting in their username, their password, 
having basically everything in self-service and allowing them to install all of these apps and settings themselves. We're trying to take baby steps towards this. We've been trying to make our faculty comfortable with self-service, putting little treats here and there. Oh, you can install your own printers now by going to self-service. Oh, you want Photoshop, you can go to self-service. So now amongst our faculty, self-service is a familiar term so that when we're putting more emphasis on them, it's not something that's completely alien. And then th that increased buy-in is another big part of that. Basically give people a reason to use self-service before it becomes an absolute necessity to their job. And again, user's responsibility. The more emphasis that we put on our users to look after their own laptop and have a one-to-one -one laptop and have a responsibility for ensuring that the apps that they need to do the job are on the laptop, people take things more seriously. And then you see less broken screens, less loss. Encourage self-service, we've spoken about that. And then ideally it's the no step three um, philosophy. Ideally we want to get to a point where we can just buy the laptops, put them in the correct pre-stages and then give them to our users and just have them do everything themselves. Okay. So thank you very much for listening and uh, we're happy to take any questions if you guys have them. I know it's nearly lunchtime so we're not offended if you're not. <laughs> yeah, we've got about, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. We've got about 15 minutes for questions, so feel free to come up, um, line up and ask them. I actually have a quick one for you guys. Fire away. Uh, besides the increase in hardware going to one-to-one, -one, have you seen an increase in workload for the two of you from going from a shared model to a one-to-one -one model, like your day-to-day -day tasks? Interesting. Um, not really, actually. Um, it was actually, if any, I would say it's actually been about the same, mainly because we still scope policies and profiles to groups. It's just that the groups have changed, but um, there might be individual requests now, but we can just tie that to a specific user's computer, whereas before we used Active Directory binding for IMAX, and there might be multiple teachers using a certain computer. So if a teacher made a request, we'd have to first double check that they were using a like there might be two computers in a classroom. So some ways, some things are easier actually and then other things might be a little bit more difficult. But I'd, I'd say like overall it's, it's like a wash. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that a big thing that I've noticed personally is that we would get requests of like this shared laptop car has number 13, 14 and 16 missing. We don't know where it is. Or this laptop has keys missing or they've put the keys in a different order and all that fun stuff that kids like to do. But now, because we know whose laptop belongs to who, it makes it more, that increased responsibility is leading to less kind of requests of find this laptop, repair this laptop, and all that kind of thing. Okay. All right, doesn't, oh, got a question. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, hey. Um, I've, I've been listening to one-to-one -one conversations during this conference, and something that people seem to talk a lot about is um, uh, because there's a larger number of devices, um, you know, what if they're lost or stolen? Like, does that, do you encounter that more frequently now or, or have to deal with that? I think, if anything, we had more issues when we had shared laptop mm -hmm. carts. Laptops would just kind of disappear and... Uh, one thing that helped was uh, once we had external access to the JSS, some started checking in from the outside, and then we were able to uh, put a passcode lock on them with a message stating where they need to go to send them back. And a number of them appeared at the security desk, like, you know, within a few days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then otherwise, uh, the DEP laptops, we can also lock those remotely. Um, even if we don't get it back, it, it'll mean that the person who has it won't be able to get any use out of it and damn them, <laughs> you know. What kind of education do you do for your end users regarding uh, telling them about self-service and how it's used and the fact that it even exists? That's a good question. So um, the, the big thing, actually, after I attended JNOC last year, there was a session I attended and uh, it was basically about leaving uh, incentives to use self-service. 
So if we could make users' life easier by getting them to go to self-service, then do so. So have all the printers available in self-service and things that make them go there and then they get comfortable with using it. Something that I really try and do at RSS is if anyone is having any issues with any kind of technology in the school, they can uh, request one-on-one -on -one meetings with me and I can go and talk them through the process and then basically ensure that they're comfortable. And then something that's interesting as well that's happened at RSS is that when you make certain faculty members aware of the benefits of self-service, yes. they then go and tell others, oh, do you, you realize you can get that there, right? You don't have to call IT. Like, IT might be busy, you don't have to worry about it, you can do it yourself. And then the benefits of that then start to spread and then before we knew it, everyone pretty much is now aware of self-service. Uh, All right, well, thank you, guys. Oh, I think Appreciate we have tonight. another question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got a couple for you, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> um, so what tool are you guys using to keep a record of previous passwords? Um, well, we're actually going to be allowing, uh, there was a, we had a password, at, we basically had an encrypted file that, this was something from the higher-ups, they wanted us to know, like, the students' passwords and everything. Um, there might come a time where we allow them to reset the passwords to whatever they want, you know, but it has to, of course, satisfy the InfoSec, like, password requirements. Um, that's sort of a culture thing. But, yeah, we had a, an encrypted file that we had them on. You know, I'd say that's kind of like a no-no, but we sort of have to do it right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, when you guys refresh laptops, how do you go about associating the new devices with their appropriate student pre-stage? Well, the student pre-stage is uh, the same regardless of uh, the age of the device, but for refreshes, we haven't had to do a one-to-one -one refresh yet because we just started the one-to-one, -one, but I imagine, uh, you know, we have, a, we have basically a, a uh, extension attribute that basically tracks uh, how long we've had the computer for, and I think once it hits, like, whatever amount of days equals three years or something, it'll, it'll pop up and, you know, it'll, it'll be added to like a list, you know? Gotcha. And uh, I think we're going with like three or four years. And then uh, if that person, like this is really more for faculty because right now what we did was uh, for the middle school, fifth through eighth, we actually gave them recycled laptop cart, like from the carts themselves, other than the fifth and sixth graders got brand new ones, seventh and eighth. So what will ultimately happen when we do our first refresh, uh, you know, I think we're still kind of learning how that's gonna go overall. Yeah. You know, but it's a good question. Gotcha. And one last one. Um, with student local accounts, do you guys run into any issues with updating or installing software um, due to lack of administrative privileges? Well, we have it so that uh, the Mac OS um, updates automatically install, and uh, you know, the user can't unclick that um, and then we have a configuration profile for like the office apps so that the office apps are set to automatically update on their own without any user intervention. And you know, we can push out patches and stuff like that in the background. And if there's a restart required, you know, we'll put, you know, a message will pop up saying, you know, your computer will restart in so and so amount of time. If, uh, you know, unless you click restart now, it will eventually restart whether you like it or not. Um, but, uh, we try not to do that too much because it's disruptive. Yeah. You know? if, and if we need the, the students to have particular applications, we'll make them available in self-service so they can install them without the admin credentials. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, guys. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I think uh, that's it. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Adam and Stephen. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks.